right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome in Husker Chat Live. My name is Jeff Cameron. The star of the show is right there on your screen. He's Sean Callahan of Husker Online. We're talking Husker football with him. Husker Chat Live. Good to be with you. And uh, first of all, Sean, I look forward to this moving forward. We're going to have opportunities, I think, to get together and talk a little Husker football and all things college football in general moving forward here and uh, kind of get through these summer months and get excited about the fall. Yeah, we've done a lot of fun stuff on our channel, Jeff, but I'm, I'm looking forward to this. We've never really been able to do a show that features our staff. It's usually me interviewing somebody else. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to this tonight uh, just to get the chance um, to share some of my thoughts. Because there's a lot going on here. I mean, um, there's a lot going on in college football, especially as we, as we know with NIL and other things, but transfer portal. Uh, so we've got a lot of ground we're going to try to cover here tonight. Well, I want to get to the fun stuff here in just a second, which is the players, the additions for Nebraska football via the transfer portal. Uh, really some nice additions, and I want you to expound on that. But first, why don't we start with uh, the, the news of what the NCAA penalties were, the findings of the NCAA investigation involving Nebraska's misusage of special teams analyst Jonathan Rutledge. Uh, those findings are complete. We now know uh, what they are, and obviously we, we, we've heard from – uh, officials at Nebraska, but your thoughts on that, and let, let's get through with that part of the conversation so we can get to the fun stuff. Yeah, you know, in 2020, it was the pandemic season, and um, Nebraska never got to go through spring practice. Um, they never had a full-time special teams coach. They never had anybody on staff with that title, and what the plan was going to be was all of the 10 full-time coaches would have a duty and then they were going to have an analyst kind of manage it behind the scenes. Well, that analyst, Jonathan Rutledge, ended up having to do more. And, you know, what, you're, you're, the analysts aren't allowed to go on the field and coach and do instruction and teaching. Uh, well, they, they determined that he did do that. And that's a level two infraction. And when you read the language of kind of what came out from the NCAA, it sounds a lot worse. I mean, they're like a show cause. And, you know, you, you immediately think like, oh, man, Bruce Pearl show. I mean, something like really right. bad. Um, but. The penalty really is $10,000 fine. You've got to attend a rules clinic. And then Scott Frost has got to be away from the building for five consecutive days from August until December. And it can be one of their bye weeks. And Nebraska has two bye weeks this year. Um, so it, that's going to be what happens. Scott Frost will miss probably a week around his program in over a bye week. Um, and he won't be allowed in the building for that week. And that's really the brunt of the penalty. Um, there'll be a couple practices where – um, some analysts and non-coaches won't be allowed to be there. Um, but it, it was definitely, it came off way worse sounding. But when you really dig into it, um, this is a very small slap on the wrist. Really quickly, I'm kind of curious, Sean, because we've seen how little the NCAA has done over the last few years, if you will. Um, how did this come to light? We see so few instances, as I say, where the NCAA enforces much of anything these days. Yeah, in 2020, it kind of came out and, you know, there's theories, oh, did Jonathan Rutledge, who lost his job after that season, blow the whistle? Um, I was told really more what happened was, you know, somehow some footage got out or somebody saw some footage in another school um, in the Big Ten might have turned them in um, because they were the only team in the conference that year that did not have one of their, you know, they were the only team in the conference without a coach on staff that carried a special team's title. And to me, that was probably a red flag right there. Like, you know, you, you, with 10 coaches and a head coach, typically somebody's going to carry at least a title of special teams. Nobody did. Um, so I think the whole setup of it kind of got them in trouble from the get-go. And especially, it didn't really help them much. I mean, their special <laughs> teams that year was brutal. Um, they, they gave up multiple kick returns for touchdowns. Um, Aaron, you know who Aaron Crookshanks is by chance? Um, he ran, I think he ran two kicks back in the Rutgers game. Um, that Nebraska almost lost that final game of the year. And they uh, ended up getting this year, they have a full-time special teams coach, Bill Bush, um, who was at LSU with that Orgeron. And he was the guy that brought Joe Burrow to LSU for Orgeron. So they've got a guy that I think is going to really get it going, but that special teams approach really kind of backfired and it led to an investigation. Uh, final thing, then we'll get to the players really quickly. Is there anything that's still being investigated, or is this it? That's all. Trev Alberts has spoken on this. It, he was satisfied with everything that happened. Uh, but, but we're not going to hear anything more about this, and, and Nebraska's ready to move forward. Yeah, good question, because there was some speculation in 2020. Uh, Nebraska did do workouts over the pandemic. And um, if you remember during that wild time, mm. um, 
everybody in the country kind of left their campus. Nebraska brought their student athletes back to Lincoln. They provided meal service that was like grab and go meal service, but they had an offsite facility where the athletes had to pay a membership to go in and work out and train. And that, um, according to Brett McMurphy, um, he, he brought that up in his initial report back in August. Uh, I was told that that part of the investigation was dropped. There was nothing to that part of it. Um, in terms of those workouts that Nebraska did over the pandemic, it was just the misusage of an analyst. All right. On to player news. A lot more fun to talk about. Indeed. I want to start for those that haven't heard you weigh in on this, uh, O'Shawn Mathis, and what his addition means to Nebraska. For those that don't know out there, and I don't know who those would be, certainly watching Husker online, but an all-Big 12 performer with TCU, comes to Nebraska. I think it's important to note that he comes to Nebraska over Texas. Also, if you go back before, he whittled down his list. Comes to Nebraska over schools not only like Texas, but USC, Ole Miss, Penn State, and others. Sean, that's a big deal. This is a quality player. This is a guy that's produced at a big-time level in the Power Five. What were your thoughts and are your thoughts on O'Shawn Mathis? Yeah, to kind of put it in uh, context, Jeff, um, the Athletic.com had O'Shawn Mathis on Saturday – the number one ranked player available in the transfer portal. Um, so it really puts it into perspective. You know, when you're that highly ranked, there's going to be a lot of people that want you. And he's a guy that the last two years has put up 30 plus quarterback pressures. Um, so he's going to get you three quarterback disruption or uh, more plays per game. He led the Big 12 with nine sacks in 2020. He had just four a year ago but still was very active in terms of quarterback hits, quarterback pressures um, at 6'5", 260. He's going to give Nebraska somebody that can get to the quarterback. And when Scott Frost first came here from Central Florida, they ran more of a 3-4. Uh, they have retooled this system since 2020 into more of a multiple, but I would say an even front. And they're going to run, in my opinion, a true 4-3 front or 4-3 type look. O'Shawn Mathis with Garrett Nelson. Um, then they have Caleb Tanner. Those guys will be able to get to the quarterback. I mean, when you break down just the Big Ten West, that's as good of a trio as there's going to be getting to a quarterback um, in the Big Ten West. Um, and, and, you know, that that was a question. I mean, they had to get this guy. I mean, you talk about all the things they've added to this team. They've added a quarterback from Texas, a quarterback from Florida State, Chubba Purdy, um, yeah. Trey Palmer from LSU, um, you, you go down Tommy Hill, a corner from Arizona State. This is by far the most valuable guy they've brought into this roster in the offseason. Let's talk about uh, Devin Drew, Texas Tech defensive lineman, now a Husker. How big of a get is that? And then in a moment, I want to ask you, Sean, just overall Scott Frost's uh, philosophy on, on transfer portals. It's a, it's a brave new world in college football, and we're watching different schools take different approaches. And uh, we know certainly it can be a way to supplement your roster for areas that are lacking. But uh, let's start with Devin Drew. Yeah, you look at Devin Drew, um, 6'2 and a half, 6'3, 285. Talk to him today after his announcement. Um, he had seven Power Five offers from the portal uh, TCU, Indiana, Illinois, and Nebraska were his visits. He also had Vanderbilt, Kansas, and Kansas State. So, a highly sought after Power Five defensive lineman. He has played over 900 snaps in two seasons at Texas Tech. Um, there's nobody on this roster that's played anywhere close to that. So, you basically have added. Two guys, and O'Shawn Mathis and now Devin Drew, that have played more snaps than anybody else on this current Husker defensive line because they just got decimated. That Casey Rogers went in the portal, Ben Stilley graduated, Damian Daniels went pro, DeAndre Thomas um, ended up deciding not to play a six year of football. Um, so you look at just some of the things they lost. These are upgrades in a lot of respects. Devin Drew, a Kansas City kid, uh, three hours away from Lincoln. Um, I think that was a big part of his decision. He told me he wanted his mom to be able to drive to games, get up here to games, um, you know, the other places that wasn't going to be possible. So I think location helped. Playing time obviously helped. They're going to play him on the inside. He, he'll he play more of a three technique and a four three. But he's like, look, I've played the zero. I've played the one because I, I've played everything out to the six. So he's very versatile um, on how he's played the D line. But he knows at the next level, his true position is a three technique, and that's what enticed him about Nebraska was the opportunity. And let's face it, the Big 12 versus the Big 10, when you're talking about linemen, uh, the Big 10 
is a much better league, and the draft shows that. And I think both of these guys, Devin Drew and O'Shawn Mathis, they look at that. They're like, look, if I go into Nebraska in the Big Ten against teams like Wisconsin and Michigan and Iowa and put up stats on the line of scrimmage, I'm going to get drafted. I'm going to have a really good chance to go to the pros. Yeah, versatile, and as you correctly noted there, very durable. So you're going to have a guy who doesn't miss time on the football field and can help you out all across the defensive line as well. Were you signing, I'm going to come back to a couple of players here in a second that Nebraska has their eye on, but were you surprised to see, just out of curiosity, Sean, just three Nebraska players go into the portal this past week for the May 2nd deadline? You know, I think we're still learning about how this portal and the timelines will work. To me, the real hot season is going to be after the regular season ends in December and January. Um, I, I do think you'll get a wave of pre-spring football guys, guys that want to get their money, essentially like secure their funding for the semester, then go on the portal. That way they have the whole semester to stay in mm -hmm. classes, get their stipend checks. Uh, that's, what, that, that's what McCaffrey did when he left here to go to Rice um, in, in Louisville before that. But I, I think the end of spring ball – from what I've gathered and I've talked to people, there's not as many good players that have gone in right now than maybe back in December and January. Um, I, I think a lot of it is the guys that go in now, they were hoping maybe they can have a better opportunity to play or things go right. Um, and, and we didn't really see any really high profile guys go in. I mean, we saw, you know, Alabama had a couple guys go in and we'll talk about those guys in a bit. Um, that were back in rotation guys. I think that's a lot of what we've seen go in the portal. For Nebraska, former Navy SEAL, Damian Jackson went in the portal. He's a six-year senior, played 20 games, spot duty. Chris Walker had already left the team, decided to go in the portal. Um, so that really is a count. And then uh, Latrell Neville, um, a wide receiver that was kind of buried as a, a, as a redshirt freshman, he went in the portal. So um, I think you're going to see, though, some more guys – leave this roster, whether it be be a medical scholarship, whether it be graduate transfer. And today in our Husker Online chat, a lot of people kind of were panicking, like, how are they going to get to 85? You know, because everyone's kind of pushing that number right now. And I said, look, they'll get to 85. They have to be 85. I, I you know, Don't be worried about that. There's going to be things that happen, whether it's medically re related or guys going in or guys retiring. Um, you know, it, it will it will work itself out in the end if Nebraska adds a few more players. Speaking of adding a few more players, uh, let's look at uh, on the transfer radar two Alabama players uh, now there, uh, defensive back and Kane Williams, who's going to visit Nebraska this month, May the 13th. Uh, I believe May the 13th is that date. And defensive lineman Stephon Wynn Jr. also uh, on the radar there. Talk about those two Bama players and the chances Nebraska lands one, if not both those guys. Yeah, Nebraska right now has a lot of lines in the water with the transfer portal. You know, it's not a finished product yet. I mean, they're really kind of just testing the water, seeing who's out there. But two names that really kind of emerged, especially after O'Shawn Mathis and now Devin Drew's commitments, Kane Williams, a defensive back at Alabama, and then Stefan Wynn. And you're asking, if you're a Nebraska fan, you're saying, why, why are they looking at a defensive back? Um, I, I think, you know, you look at the safety position, there's just a lot of unknowns. Noah Pullagates is an unknown. Isaac Gifford, young guy. Miles Farmer, he's a solid player, but is he truly a difference maker? I think Marquise Buford at safety is a really good player right now, potentially, um, but they would like, I think, one more guy, if he's an elite player like Kane Williams, uh, to come in. And then, you know, Stefan Wynn, um, he kind of was the back end of the rotation at Alabama. And and if you're the back end of a rotation in Alabama, you could probably start for 95% of college football. And, you know, this is an opportunity where, look, look, you're playing 10 snaps a game for Nick Saban, we can get you 30 or 40 at Nebraska maybe a game, and that might get you the tape you need to get on to the next level. Yeah, it's interesting, Sean. We see this, and it may be the benefit of the transfer portal. Uh, as we talk about players leaving programs now, certainly in a way they never used to, and no matter where anybody sits on that side of the debate, the bottom line is there are only so many starting positions at these schools, and if you have an abundance of players like Georgia just did with 15 of them going in the NFL draft, which seems absurd, and it was an NFL record, a school record, I should say, uh, NCAA record, you know, you're going to get – the fall off of guys, maybe third string on the depth chart. They were five-star recruits and they want a chance to play and they may choose schools 
for a variety of reasons, playing time being chief amongst them, but also could be regionality, could be they're from a certain place, they want to get back home. And so the runoff from a school like Alabama or Ohio State or a school like Georgia, as we just saw, could be the benefit for Nebraska and a whole bunch of other schools for that matter. Because like you said, a, a Kane Williams probably starts 95, 98% of the places he goes to at Alabama, maybe not so much. Yeah, and, and with the transfer portal, it's going to be even easier for the Nick Sabans and the Kirby Smarts to recruit over a guy. If they see a weakness, they've got armies of personnel staffs that are going to find the next best guy and offer the next opportunity to that guy. So um, it's a different game. There's no doubt uh, when you kind of look at just what the portal's done and how easy it is to have access to players. Um, and I think it can help Nebraska. I really do. Um, because before the portal wave of guys that they got in December and January, um, and, and then the recent one here in May and April, um, you know, they, they were struggling in recruiting. I mean, you look at just their haul of guys they got last May and June, it it was not impressive. I mean, it was the lowest rated group of guys we had seen in a long time at Nebraska. It just didn't have the pop to it. Um, you know, and I felt like the transfer portal kind of, Reju rejuvenated the recruiting efforts for Nebraska and you know can it be Mel Tucker Michigan State we don't know um, but you feel like that's the approach Nebraska's taken I think it's the approach that a lot of schools are taking and probably the right one to fill in those those parts of the roster that are that are lacking and I guess I would ask you about another player uh, whispers out there about Florida defensive lineman Lamar Goods, does Nebraska have interest in him? Obviously a, a huge individual, to say the least, just in terms of sheer mass, uh, but also was really well thought of, obviously, coming out of high school and, and now has put his name in the portal. Yeah, Canadian guy uh, that played at a prep school in Connecticut. Um, kind of got buried at Florida. I would tell you this right now, Jeff. When you look at what Nebraska has already gotten this week now with Devin Drew and O'Shawn Mathis, I think they'll take one more if they can on the D-line. And to me, Win is that next guy. Um, to me, Goods is probably a step back when you start to kind of look at the board of spots that you have. Um, now, Goods did tell me last week he plans to visit Nebraska and later in May, but it's kind of one of those deals. Can they, Will it even get to that point? Um, I would be surprised today if he's on campus for a visit, uh, but we'll see. Sean, Big Ten spring meetings are coming up. Later this month, obviously, what might we learn about the future of Big Ten scheduling for 2023 and, and beyond for that matter? Yeah, you know, the spring meetings are on in full force right now in Phoenix. I think everybody's down there, but uh, we'll learn more about the Big Ten. Um, I guess some of it opened up today. Uh, Kevin Warren was down in Phoenix today um, talking about the media rights deal yeah. and, you know, where that's going to go. And you're down in the ACC land, and I know that's a hot topic in your country because – you, you guys are saddled with this large ESPN contract that's kind of preventing um, the league from making money. And the Big Ten, on the other hand, they're in a position where, you know, they're already making $55 million a year. And within a couple of years, that's going to be in the 70s and the 80s. And, you know, within the late 2020s, they're going to be making over $100 million per team. Um, I think right now, it's how are they going to decide what network partners to go to. I feel really good that Fox is still going to be – um, in this thing um, with BTN and FS1. I mean, that's their core partner. I think the other question, though, is NBC and CBS, are they going to get in? Um, and CBS has to replace the SEC. NBC would love to marry the Big Ten with Notre Dame uh, because there's only seven Notre Dame home games per year on NBC. So there's a lot of Saturdays that NBC would love to have a, uh, an afternoon game on. A lot of Saturdays where they probably would love to have double headers. Um, so the Big Ten is very much in a great position to negotiate this next media rights deal. Um, it's a matter of who comes at them. And then will, will there be a wild card? Will they pull an MLB and go to Apple TV or Amazon? I, I, what do you think of um, what do you think of uh, MLB Friday night on Apple TV? Have you caught any of that yet, Jeff? Yeah, well, I, I, one thing that you note, Sean, you're right. I mean, I cover college football, but I cover it from down in ACC land, as you just noted. And, of course, everybody in the ACC frets because they're absolutely buried. You know, the ACC is, is buried when it comes to trying to compete with the SEC and the Big Ten 
when you're talking dollar for dollar, it's not even close. And, and the feeling is one of desperation. But the thought amongst most of the schools in the ACC is they look at this, they think that what's going to dictate the future of all of college sports and to become less and less regional, which is what it's kind of gone to now, is that you need TV. Basically, you need those in, in, in the television industry and the streaming uh, partners to decide uh, whether or not they're going to break away. And then you have a massive, whether that's two, you know, basically the power five all come together and then you have a massive league and everybody else who doesn't want to pony up for that uh, plays a different brand of football and the power five operates under their own set of rules, whatever it might be. But that is what they believe will save them in the interim. But you don't have to worry about that. Nebraska has other concerns and, but the sec and the big 10, when you look at the draft, it's those two conferences and they also, it has happens to coincide with all the money. So it's not so surprising. And meanwhile, everybody else is saying, you, you want us to join? You want us to come on in? Yeah, and, and it will be interesting to see um, just w- will they leave ESPN ABC? I think they will, um, mainly because ESPN ABC has taken over the SEC. And if I'm in the ACC, I don't like that yeah. because – Basically, the only games that are going to be on ABC are Florida State, Miami, and Clemson. You know, they're not going to be a lot of other teams that get those ABC windows other than the big brands. They're not going to be putting Wake Forest on ABC. Um, (laughs) So even though they're a good team, uh, but it's the dollars and the ratings that matter. And I think the Big Ten, that that this is going to pave the way for them to not be on the ESPN networks. And that's going to be interesting to see um, where it all goes. And it leads to the other topic scheduling jeff what what will the big 10 do and you know i was initially excited about the schedule alliance um but i I don't think that's going to get off the ground um i i think the big 10 will stick with nine league games um especially when the playoff expands um that's going to be a good thing but they have proven that they can make the most money by playing nine games the sec should go to nine uh, but they want to protect their head coaches and their records and they stick at eight um, but the more you make so much more money with a nine, uh, ninth league game, I get it. Everyone has one more loss across the board. Um, but you know, the, I think the revenue and the brand, um, that's what they're going to do. Now, the question is, will they eliminate divisions? I mean, that that's the big, and I, I think the feel is they might, I think that the feel is they want to stage the two highest ranked teams, maybe yeah. in the conference championship game. Uh, but my argument is this. What happens? Michigan and Ohio State play Thanksgiving. Then they have to play the next weekend again. Um, is that good for anybody? Um, so the divisional format I thought allowed for um, some, you know, better matchups in that sense, not rematch games. Um, but Ohio State and Michigan now last year uh, they've dominated this conference title game, and maybe they want to try to change that up um, where the West has a chance. Uh, or, you know, uh, the, this a different look for the title game. But, yeah, we don't know what direction it's going to go uh, with the futuring of the schedule, especially when that alliance thing has kind of died. Sean, one other thing to ask you as we wrap up here tonight, Husker Online, really appreciate you guys joining us. This is going to be fun, and Sean and I are going to get a chance to chat live together moving forward. I certainly hope that's true. Uh, I love talking Husker football with you and and, and getting an opportunity to do it with all of your uh, subscribers and viewers here. But the Ireland planning and full go for Nebraska's Week Zero game, what do you know about that trip thus far? Well, uh, Nebraska sent out a team of people um, last week, and they were out in Dublin. checking out everything, you know, seeing the hotel, um, kind of the, pra- the the facilities, the practice. I mean, this is a bull trip on steroids. I mean, you're going all the way overseas for a week to play a conference football game. By the way, I think they'd take Florida State or uh, so they, they'd gladly take you guys out there in, in your neck of the woods sure. uh, to play in Dublin if, if uh, t- Seminole fans would get that, get out that way. But um, it's an exciting trip. I, I think you'll you'll probably get about ten thousand Nebraska fans go. I know they probably wanted more than that, um, but a lot of things out of our control um, probably have limited the the number of travelers that will go out there. It will still be a really good turnout. Um, the stadium seats fifty two thousand. I was able to go to Dublin um, as part of one of the promotion promoters for the game uh, with a, a advertising deal we're doing on Husker Online. Um, so I've seen the stadium. I've seen the layout. Um, now Scott Frost was supposed to go out later this month he's not going to make it out there um just because of conflicts back in lincoln um but yeah they're they're getting ready to go um you know as far as and and they'll they'll take it won't be like a normal road roster of just 74 uh they'll take the full fall camp roster of 110 players 
and um, they'll they'll essentially spend an entire week in Dublin. Sean, I know you'll be devastated to have to go back to Dublin, Ireland, uh, yet again. You know, I mean, I don't want to assume too much about you. We're just getting to know each other a little bit better. But uh, I'm a Cameron. You're a Callahan. I mean, hey, rolling out to Ireland isn't a bad thing to watch a little college football, right? Yeah, and you've got Guinness. You've got um, you've got Jameson. <laughs> um, I'll tell you, seafood in Dublin is really good, too. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's really, really top-notch seafood. And it's just a different feel. You go into, like, bars there. There's no TVs. I mean, the pubs, like no one's watching sports. No one has their phones out. It, it's just people drinking Guinness and talking. I mean, it, it, it's a totally different feeling when you go out there and everyone is so nice and welcoming. Um, I had a wonderful trip. I uh, was able to check out Port Marmot Golf Course, uh, the Book of Kales, Trinity College. Um, so we, we really um, were able to see a lot. And I'm looking forward. We're taking our uh, we're taking a staff of four of us out there uh, for the whole week. Um, so I'm guessing we'll maybe do some live shows out in Ireland as well. Yeah, good times. Uh, I, that's where I went on my honeymoon. So yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you on that all the way across. Hey, Sean, this has been a lot of fun. Let's chat again here real soon. Husker online. We'll do it again. Uh, I love getting your insight. I know everybody does. Uh, we would invite everybody to like and subscribe, lock it in, make sure you know the next time the video is coming, we'll promote it and let you know when we get back together and we'll go over the topics du jour there for Nebraska football. It's a good time. Sean, this has been great. Thanks to everybody again. Let's do it again real soon, sir. Absolutely. Hey, thanks a lot, Jeff. Appreciate everything. Absolutely. Take care. And also, thank you for producing, Matthew. We appreciate it. Be well, everybody.